Vegas. And um, I, I've talked about this a little bit, but like maybe two years ago, I think I just looked it up. Two years ago, I realized once things get about 15 feet away from me, it's all blurry when I don't have glasses on, which means I can see Deborah, but those two behind you look a little seedy. I'm not sure who that is. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Uh, that, that's, I, I, I have a tough time seeing far distance and it seemed to just show up. It was an you are getting old moment for me where I said, I literally went in, not in glasses my whole life, I went in to see the ophthalmologist and I just said, hey, listen, um, I have a tough time seeing far away, but it's happened very quickly and very recently. So I think something's wrong. And he looked at me, he goes, I'll tell you what's wrong. I said, what? He goes, you're over 40. <laughs> I was like, I didn't know that was a disease, but okay, we'll take it, right? So it's a thing. If you're under 40, it's a thing. Some things are going to happen all of a sudden when you turn 40 or those couple of years after you turn 40, we're going to go, what is going on? You're going to ache in places you didn't know you had. You're going to stop being able to see. It's bad news, okay? Um, so I have prescription um, sunglasses that are over here, but those won't be cool to wear in church. And I don't even know where my other ones are. But I realized that when I started driving with my prescription sunglasses, that all of a sudden I knew where I was going a lot better. <laughs> and we don't do as much highway driving anymore, but for someone who literally almost lived their life on the highway, um, you know, it's kind of important when you're going fast, we'll just say that, on the highway to be able to see which exit you're coming up on. And Robin was noticing with increasing time when she was in the passenger seat, and she is a passenger princess, let me tell you, if you don't know what that is, she's it. She was in the passenger seat next to me, and she was noticing more and more that I was exiting later and later. And that is because I didn't know what exit was. I saw the green sign, and I knew any moment the number was going to become clear, and then I would exit. So I have these prescription sunglasses I wear so that I can see where I'm going. And I, I realize that faith and faith tradition and religion, especially religion, the man-made part of our faith, the part that's just been developed and not supported by scripture or by the heart of God, has a way of blurring our vision for what's important. And I will say this to you, uh, personally, and I don't want to put this on you as your story, but my story is we were taught to focus on things and to focus on, be attentive or, or be aware of, of things that today I realize didn't actually benefit anyone, including me. We spent a lot of time and attention trying to change who people were. And the underlying methodology ended up at the end of the day being how can we in the most loving way show them how much they're lacking? That's what it comes down to, right? Now, this boy right here knows all the language and all the ways. And it's real slick how we do it. But we, for, for a long time, and we've always done the best with what we knew in that moment. And, and I don't ever look back at those years and, and, and um, I, I, don't, I don't look back at those years and, and think to myself, oh gosh, I, I, I wish that we would have understood some things sooner, but all of those moments brought us to where we are now. And, and I'm grateful for the journey. Amen, church? But I'll say this. I, we learned that we present the gospel in the most open, loving way as possible to the unbeliever. And then once the unbeliever then accepts the message that Jesus died for their sins, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and they get in here, then we said, now we're going to disciple you, which is code for, let me tell you all of the things wrong in your life that you need to fix, but we're going to give you a real, so let's start with, you need to read your Bible X amount of time, you need to pray X amount of time, you need to make sure that you're tithing, you need to make sure that you're at the men's retreat, the women's retreat, and for some of you both, that's a joke. Um, this, the, All of the stuff was put on people, wait, are your kids in youth group? You know, are they going to the, did they go to the youth conference? That's maybe why they're acting up in school, because they didn't go to summer camp this year. 
Um, and just more and more, did, do you have a bumper sticker? Did you get the bump? Did you put that on your car? Are you sharing our Facebook posts? Because that's going to get you into heaven. Um, like, there was all of these things that we put on people, right? And then if all of those things didn't work out in their life, and they were more depressed, and more, you know, less joy in their life, and less, you know, more angry, and more easy to fly off the handle, then we would say, well, have you tried faith? And faith was always where we ended up with because faith is something that's impossible to measure. So now we have put a, a system of measurement on people that really can't be articulated, right? So then when we'd pray for people to get healed, if they didn't get healed, we'd say, well, do you have unforgiveness? And if they said you didn't, then we'd say, you have unforgiveness, you just don't know it. There's surely, surely someone you haven't forgiven. Maybe it's an ancestor you never met. It's a generational thing. You think this is joking? This is all true. It's a generational thing. It's been passed down. You need to forgive them for your father or for your grandfather who never forgave them because this is passed down to you. You've got this generational curse in your life and you need to get rid of it and then you're going to be healed. And then they would do that. They would apologize for, you know, great, great grandpa Smith who, you know, one time stole candy from the corner store or whatever. And then they would still be sick in their bodies. And then we'd say, well, do you have enough faith? And they would say, well, I think I do. And it's amazing how quickly we start saying, well, you need to have more faith. But then, but Jesus says, I mean, he, we see in first Corinthians, it says that we need the faith of a mustard seed, which is a really small amount. It's like a trace amount of faith. So if you just can kind of maybe could have potentially believe it's enough for, for God to join with and to accomplish something in your life. So that wasn't the answer, but we said that to people. And at the end of the day, what we were communicating to people in the name of God is you are not enough. Therefore you need us perpetually. And I believe wholeheartedly that if the church, the entity of the church and the institution of the church house of worship would realize that if they create a community where people are in relationship and community with one another, they spend their time and effort on building relationship and looking after one another and being there for one another, that people will want to be in church because that's where their people are. Not because they're afraid of what happens if they don't go to church. Do you hear me? Now you've heard this from me before in a lot of different ways, but I want to make this very clear to you. And so we had a way of putting people's focus on things that didn't ultimately make a difference in their lives most of the time. And when they didn't make a difference in their life, we had something else to show them to focus on until we found something that couldn't be measured and we left them perpetually feeling like they're not enough. They haven't done enough. And that, to me, is not the gospel. It is not Jesus. It is not the divine. It is not what this was intended to look like. And so I, I was realizing that I oftentimes feel a fire in my spirit because I feel like personally, y'all please just bear with me because I'm not trying to attack anybody, but I feel personally like in the name of God, our country is going to hell. Do you see what I'm saying there? We have a lot of people doing a lot of things that don't look like Jesus in the name of Jesus. You know what? I'm just going to go there. I can't help myself, Deborah. I need some therapy. You need to refer me to somebody. I just can't help myself. I'm going to go there. Y'all, one of the most powerful Christian conservative conferences and groups. I'm just going to tell you this. Ever heard of Turning Point? Turning Point Faith, Turning Point USA? At Turning Point's conference, and if this offends you, I'm sorry, but I don't know how, I don't know where to go with this as a person of faith who I believe that God loves all. At Turning Point Faith, or Turning Point USA's conference this week, they unveiled their new brand with hats and flags and all the branding memorabilia, and the tag, the brand is now White Boy Summer. Look it up. And y'all, I'm going to go there. I'm sorry. Don't be offended with me. Uh, let me be clear. I think both of the people running for president should not be president. That's just my feeling. Personal feeling, not endorsed by the church. Personal feeling, they're both a mess for different reasons. But one of the political, our presidential candidates who headlined the event, who could be our next president, is at an event where they're proudly displaying the brand, White Boy Summer, 
with five stars underneath it. If you don't think this is like a nod to Hitler, for Hitler, it was white, blue-eyed, blonde hair. Do we have to add blue-eyed, blonde hair on there? No, because the problem is, is that Charlie Kirk has brown hair, so that's a problem. But what, what else do we need to do to say that our faith has been hijacked and millions and millions and millions and millions of people who say they follow Christ think that's okay. For all of the non-white boys in the room, how does that make you feel? Do we care? Are, are we going to just get to a point where we'll look brothers and sisters in the eyes around us, siblings of ours, people in our community, people that bleed the same color as us, and just look at them and say, my bad, I'm wearing a white boy summer hat. I got it from one of the most powerful political forces in our nation. I bought it, I support them. How could you wear that hat or fly that flag and walk down the beaches of Sarasota County where maybe 50% of the people out there aren't white boys or more? That is demonic. And I think, I'm not sure, I don't know the specific date, but I think they unveiled it on Juneteenth. Make up your own mind. It's sick. Our country's in a mess. And listen, when people do things, and it happens on both sides, I'm not trashing one side or the other. It happens on both sides where they do things that I believe are not the heart of God for humanity. But when people do things and say it's the heart of God for humanity in the name of God, and they're so not following the same Jesus that I know, that is a serious, serious problem. And that's why, and I wish I didn't have to, that's why I have to stand up here some Sundays and make political statements. I don't want to make them, but when politics has now taken over simple human rights and begin to distort the rights of fellow citizens and fellow siblings of ours, that's when you have to speak up in the name of God and say what they're saying in the name of God isn't true. And what I'm saying in the name of God, I believe is wholeheartedly true, which is no matter who you are, what color your skin, who, uh, your ability, your, your uh, sexuality, or any of those things, None of that separates you from being equal in the sight of God. Amen? Come on, do you hear me? White boy summer. First of all, no one wants to see this on the beach, okay? This is too much white, all right? The sand is white. We need some things that aren't this white out there. You won't even be able to see me. You'll just see hair. You'll think there's just a toupee floating around Siesta Key. That's what you're going to see out there, all right? I didn't, some of you got a visual with that, didn't you? See how that focus thing is, right? And, and one of the things that I've, and I don't, I, I've kind of ranted the first half of my sermon, and I'm sorry, because uh, there's some things I want to say here, and I apologize, but I'm a little fired up. Um, H.G. Wells, H.G. Wells said that human history has become more and more a race between education and catastrophe. And unfortunately, along with a lot of other institutions out there, institutions of faith have run from the idea of education, even educating their own people about the scriptures, giving them an opportunity to have an educational environment where they can ask questions and learn. They've run away from that idea, and therefore we are facing either catastrophe, I'm not trying to be a downer, I just want you to hear me, a catastrophe, or we need to really, really, really know what's behind all of the stuff that's out there. And it is not God. It just isn't. Um, and uh, let me just say this to you. Uh, I, right now, I, I don't want you to think of a pink elephant. I don't want you to think about a pink elephant. Can you do that for me? How many of you thought of a pink elephant when I said that? Right. Um, I don't want you to... Uh, to, to to focus on um, to focus on the yellow stripes down here beneath me. I don't want you to see those. See, our nat natural inclination is what we're hearing and what we're to being told to focus on 
no matter how much we think we can trick our minds to not seeing it or focusing on, we will focus on it, right? So if, if, if in the presidential debate that's this week, one of them says about the other, something as like egregious as something like crazy, and this is for real, like they said, you know, just out, this guy over here is, you know, a registered uh, convicted sex offender, right? You think, oh my God, you can't do that, that's slander, that's all that kind of stuff. Now that could happen with these two, you never know, right? It could happen. But they could say, I just want to make it very clear, I want to make it very clear, my, my opponent here has never been convicted of a sex crime. I want to make it very clear, they've never been convicted of a sex crime. It still paints the person negatively, right? Uh, one time I was at a debate where, I said, where somebody said, I want to make it very clear, I know there's a lot of accusations out there, but the gentleman here has never cheated on his wife. What does everybody begin to think of? I wonder if he cheated on his wife, right? So we have this ability in spaces, especially when you have a guy with a microphone or a lady with a microphone and a group of people are like, teach us, oh master, right? If you have that going on, you, Jedi, right? You, you, you can say, we love everyone. You can say, God is for everyone. You can say, Jesus took care of sin on the cross and don't you worry about a thing but we have ways of bringing attention to things that people can't get their minds off of and one of them in particular is sin there are people in this church body who have not heard me who haven't heard me in years throw back their mistakes of their life in their face years the house of worship they go to is not reinforcing that nonsense. And yet, they're still struggling under the guilt and shame of mistakes of their past. That's how ingrained it is in us. If something is, is, is put out there, even if we're told not to focus on it, we immediately, our brain goes to focus on it. We are fixated on the thing that we are told usually not to fixate on. So if you're tired of hearing words like love around here, inclusion, affirming, kind, compassionate, community, grace, whatever, hope, joy, if you're hearing too many of those words around here, it's because we are trying to, we are trying to, as a community, flush those things that are ingrained on us to focus about and literally clean our minds from anything and everything that would bring you to a point where you would feel like you were not created in the beautiful image of God. And it is hard, and it can't only be accomplished in church. It is so hard, so difficult. It is the battle. It's the battle for me. If you say the number one thing that I, I have a challenge of when it comes to doing my job well, it's getting people to believe that they're not less than. And every person in here, even the white boy Summers, <laughs> feel less than in some capacity. It's probably why they think they have to do that, because they're ultimately feeling less than. It, our insecurities breed within us a toxic level of anti-love and anti-God thoughts and behaviors. Getting people to believe, well, you don't understand or you don't know. Do you really think that you're going to tell me something that's going to shock me? <laughs> you have no idea the things I've heard. I mean, it would blow your mind. I've been around faith since I was born. I've been a pastor now um, in some capacity for almost, almost 20 years. I was a youth pastor, an assistant pastor, and then a lead pastor like I am now almost 20 years. I have sat with my dad even before that in rooms where people were pouring out their hearts. There is nothing you can tell me and there is nothing you can tell God where, it, listen, if there's nothing you can tell me where I'm going to look at you and go, you're hopeless, then surely there is nothing that you can tell God or that God already knows about you, that he is looking down from heaven and saying, they're a lost cause. You are not a lost cause. You are not gross. You're not disgusting. You are not less than. You are not, you know, 
you know, just a, a wild child, a bad child, a bad seed, a redheaded stepchild, whatever the ways that we say that. Hannah, do you hear me? You are not. You're not. And a, and a third of you is not, okay? A third of you, yes. You are not one third a redheaded stepchild, okay? You're not. You were created in the image of God. And the, when we say that the burden of sin was taken and defeated and the price was paid for on the cross, there is no addendum. But, you know, if you don't, if you don't, <laughs> people say to me, well, if you don't remind people of their mistakes and this and that, how are they ever going to learn? Well, first of all, shut up, because I want to follow you around and, and point out your mistakes. And I know some really critical people, some Karens. I'll bring them. No offense to your Karen. She's wonderful. Bring them along and some Chads. And we're going to just, we're going to microscope, magnifying glass your life. And at the end of the week, we'll give you a full report of all the ways you're screwing up. How's that? Well, if you don't tell them, they're never going to learn. Let me ask you a question. Has anyone ever committed suicide because they just were loved too much? Has anyone taken their own life or, or fallen into deep drug addiction because they thought to themselves, I'm so loved, I can't take it? What is the last thought on people's minds when they make a decision like that to take their own life or to, or to just disappear or to leave or to whatever? What's the last thought that goes through their brain? There's no hope for me. Where do you think they got that? I heard when they were a kid, they listened to Marilyn Manson. It wasn't Marilyn's fault. They walked into places like this. They walked into institutions of faith. They were in their homes with their parents or whatever it is. And at some point or another, what was ingrained in them is, we need to focus on what's wrong with you. We're going to focus our lens on what's wrong with you. Instead of focusing on how beautiful each and every one of us are because of him. We are not trying to become something. We are something together. We're not trying to become holy. We are called the righteousness and that we are holy because of God. We're not trying to become kings and priests. We are kings and priests. We're not trying to have our sin separated as far as the east is from the west. It's already been separated as far as the east is from the west. We're not waiting on God or the Holy Spirit or any other divine entity to come down and fix something for us. What I'm waiting for is for the church, for us, for me and you to wake the heck up and realize it's already been done. It's already been taken care of. Now live your life, love God, love people, do the right thing, and let's, let's actually accomplish something together. Come on. Well, I have a tendency for this or I have a tendency for that. I don't, you know what? If, if you understand who you are and what you are made of, anything that is destructive in your life will eventually no longer have room. People think they have to carve out, like with an ice cream, screw, ice cream scoop. If you've ever served like Neapolitan um, ice cream to kids and they only want strawberry, and if you have a picky kid because you're trying to get the strawberry but you've got a little bit of the chocolate edge right there, that's how we think, like, the sin is in our life. We have to constantly be going, well, let me think this week what i got going on and what are they going to, oh, I need to call my accountability partner. Listen, your accountability partner tells his wife and his wife tells everybody. So stop telling your accountability partner that's not going to fix you, okay? Oh, if I just, you know, if I just, uh, I remember going to youth, youth conferences as a kid. I've said this before in church, but I, I love it. I go to youth conferences as a kid, and I remember one time there was like 600 kids, you know, their hormones are raging and they're just teenagers. They're teenagers and they're just like, you know, just everything and anything. It's like, they're just all of them, all of them. And it's totally natural and normal because we all did it too, right? Right? Right, guys? Remember that? And, um, <laughs> and they're everywhere. There's like 600 of them. And then the prophet of the Lord gets up and says, one of them might be struggling with, he, the Lord told him there's some people here that are struggling with pornography. <laughs> Thank you, prophet of the Lord. How much did they pay you to come in and say that? And I was, I was leading worship at a place one time with our band and another friend of mine, and we're leading worship, and we're backstage, and we're watching the little monitor, and, and he comes on, and he says, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I looked at everybody, I said, what would be the real word of the Lord is to point out the ones that aren't struggling with pornography in this room. That would be the real word of the Lord. And is that okay? These kids are looking at this stuff? No. Is it healthy? No. Is, is it something that we, like, think is uh, uh, important for their... Um, for their development? No, absolutely not. But what are you going to accomplish by telling 600 kids that by doing something that is, is fairly normal to be inquisitive, 
and needs to be uh, guided, right? And, and, and that child needs to be loved. What do you think, what do you think making them feel like crap about themselves is going to accomplish? Other than make you feel like you've done something great for God. And then they leave there focusing on not how much God loves me, not how much God wants for me, not all the things that's been accomplished on the cross and the beauty of salvation. They focus on what's wrong with me. And if that's wrong with me, what else is wrong with me? One time I stole $20 out of my mom's wallet. Not me, I probably did, but, you know, that's wrong with me too. One time this girl was walking in the classroom and I, whatever. That's wrong with me too. And then, like growing up, I'm going to be real with you. Growing up, I did not have a ton of like super open conversations with adults in my life. When I was a teenager, I thought the stuff that I was thinking and doing or wanting to do was I was the first human on earth that felt that way. Did anyone else feel that way growing up? And then come to find out these adults in my life, they did worse. Oh, even in the last 10 years, I've heard my dad sitting around with his cousin because they used to run together. I mean, they used to run together, if you know what I mean, in small town Pennsylvania. And they're telling stories. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Why didn't you ever tell me this before to make me feel like I wasn't some bad kid, right? And it's all part of it. We think that's how people change, and it's not. Can I read a scripture and then we'll be done? Is that all right? Does any of this make any sense this morning? I'm going to end with this. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21. It's up here, but I don't have the time to go through it in this version, but you can look at it for yourself. Take a picture. I'm going to just read it in the mirror for you because I love this. It's, it's great. Verse 18. The idea of mankind's co-inclusion in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is entirely God's doing. To now realize that God has indeed brought, listen to this, final closure to the old. And for us to see everything and everyone in this new light is to simply see what God has always known to be true about us in Christ. When you have words like always, everything, everyone, final closure, I need you to get those logged right here. We are not debating human experience, opinion, or their contribution, for this is exactly what God believes. In Jesus Christ, God exchanged equivalent value to redeem us to himself. He went to the highest extreme in this acts of reconciliation to persuade us of our original word. This God has given us this as the mandate of our ministry. In other words, Listen to this. And I'm not even going to go beyond 18, and we're going to end with 18, and maybe we'll do the rest next week. Listen to this. The Bible says we have the ministry of reconciliation. This is where the scripture comes from. Here, there it is, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What that means, reconciliation, and what that means ministry is this. If God went to the highest extreme in this act of reconciliation, to persuade us of our original worth, this is now the mandate of our ministry. So, I'm really talking to Facebook world. <laughs> Don't come at me like you do sometimes and tell me that I'm a fake preacher or this is a cult church when it clearly says that we have our, the mandate of our ministry is summed up with this. Show people what their original worth is. Now, are we doing that perfectly? No. But are we wanting to? Yes. That is it. Well, yeah, but you also have to. No. That's not the mandate of our ministry. You can make up your own ministry, but it's not the ministry God gave you. The ministry God gave me and you and all of us is that we would both minister to ourselves by reminding ourselves of what our original worth is and make sure that our message to the world is, I hope you know how much you're worth. I hope you know how invaluable you are. I hope you know that there has been a great price paid for you because you're worth it. 
that's our ministry. Anything outside of those lines or contradictory to those lines are not the ministry of the gospel and the church needs to stay the heck out of it. If we, if, if we throw up a, a, a conference, whether it's liberal or conservative or whatever else, and we do it in the name of God, if it isn't reminding all mankind that they are valuable and important, it isn't the gospel and it doesn't belong being named under the name of Jesus, period. If we can get that litmus test, do I feel like, because I could watch that, that event that I said earlier, and if I'm enough in my own head and consciousness and away from being connected to the world around me, I could think to myself, for instance, white boy summer, I'm white boy, it's my summer, sounds good. Right? But if I, nobody, I don't care, you can look me in the eyes and I'll call you a liar, nobody can look me in the eyes and say that all of our siblings around us could watch that conference and watch that unveiling of that new branding and merchant product and that everybody, that sly here, or these two over here, Lindley and Shantae, can watch that, or, or many of you in this room could watch that and think, yeah, yeah, I'm being valued in that right there. Listen, I'm being shown my worth. Because what is Jesus reconciling us with on the cross? Our original design. Returning us back to our original design. The reason he created man in his image in the first place. That's what we're being reconciled with. Those thousands and thousands and thousands of years, we we're waiting for that act to reconcile us with a doing away, or, or, or not doing away with, but completing, finishing, fulfilling the obligation of the old covenant so God could bring back his original plan for us, the new covenant, which is that in me, you are the righteousness of Christ Jesus. In me, you are valuable and worth it. In me, I've paid the ultimate highest Price. I have put the ultimate highest price on your life. Brown, black, gay, straight, doesn't matter. You are, you are included in this equation. That's the ministry of the church. If you walk into a faith institution and that's not what you're hearing, walk out. Because only one version, There's, it's black and white. It's really simple. There's only two options. You're either actively involved in telling people that they're worthy, that they're valuable, that they were created originally in the design, and even the fall of man and everything that happened after that didn't disqualify the value placed on their life, didn't nullify or invalidate that at all. You're either saying that or you're not. And as the Bible says, and some of you are like this, because this has been used wrongly too. Even a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Even a little bit of that sin consciousness, even a little bit of that guilt and shame is enough. All I have to say is don't think about the pink elephant. You're going to think about it. Just a little bit ruins it all. Just a little bit ruins the whole loaf. I make pizza dough sometimes like the meat Neapolitan style, and I can make eight pizzas. But if I let it sit long enough, 24 hours, 48 hours, my 48-hour dough takes literally a tiny little pinch of yeast. And it's enough for eight pizzas if I let it sit long enough. I can do a quick dough, and it'll take like a whole freaking tablespoon, and it'll be ready in four hours. But just, I bet you, if I wait long enough, just one tiny little seed one tiny little particle of yeast that's as, about as small as a mustard seed. It's like a tiny little piece of dust almost dropped into that, dropped into that enough for eight pizzas. 72 hours, it'll have leavened, it'll have expanded just a little bit. It's why we must keep laser focused. I'll end with this. Laser focused on what our calling and our mandate and our ministry is. It's to show people that they're worth it. And when something is done in the name of God that are devaluing humanity, we must stand up and speak against it. That is not a political stance. That is not uh, uh, involving the church in something it shouldn't be involved in. Anytime human lives are devalued, if our mandate in ministry is to reconcile people with their original worth, we must stand up and speak out. We're not here to endorse anybody. We're not here to support anybody in that way. I'm here to endorse one thing, 
and that is that humanity was created in the image of God, and most of us are walking around not knowing what our original worth is. And it is our mandate and ministry while we are here on the earth to remind people they are worth it. Period. There's nothing more. It's that simple. So if people ask you, why do you go to that church? You say, oh, and then only if you feel this way. You know what? I've never felt so good about who I was created to be. That's what we hear from people. I've never felt more at peace with myself. Well, that's probably because they're not. We will argue away people saying, I feel good about myself. God wants you to feel good about yourself. God wants you to find value and worth in yourself. God wants you to feel peace. He wants you to feel all those things. Will you stand up with me? Did someone just say yay? Was it that long? All right, I'm going to be crying tonight. It's going to be your fault. It's fine. Let's pray. Can we do that? And then we'll go out to food truck Sunday. Does this make sense today? All right. Read the rest of that, verses 18 to 21. It's good stuff. Um, Father, we thank you for today. I ask you to bless everyone that is here as our hearts and our minds are just constantly at war sometimes with one another. It really feels like a, war, uh, the, a race between um, reminding ourselves with these things that you've said versus catastrophe in our own hearts and minds. And so as we venture out to do that uh, for, for one another, for this community, for the people around us, our community beyond this community, um, to let them know that they're worthy, they're worth something, they're valuable to you, to us. There's people that love them. And as we take that as the mandate of our ministry, the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling them back to their original worth and design in you and how you feel about them. And uh, as we do that, God, I ask for wisdom and strength and for as much internal resistance as we need to all of the stuff that would have us focus on things that never produce anything positive in our lives, that we would reject shame reject fear, we reject all of the stuff that religion puts on us and embrace what you've done in our lives and hearts. We thank you that you, you, got, you completed and fulfilled that covenant so that we could have this new covenant in you. We thank you that your blood was enough. Thank you that your sacrifice was more than enough. And we just thank you that we can live in that freedom today knowing who we are. We love you in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. amen. Bless the food. We'll see you outside. God bless you.